Mavis, Dr. Mavis, Sai, thank you for joining this very important series that we focus on collective suffering and collective well-being. This is part of the World Happiness Foundation series. Um, and I mean, and you are part of the board. So you are one of those people in the world that are really uh, not just thinking, but actually acting and, and really helping so many people uh, everywhere with inspiration, with research, with wisdom uh, around uh, trauma, around healing, around, uh, well, basically reflecting how to go from awareness uh, to courage, to love. So let me just introduce yourself uh, briefly. And well, you are the co-founder. Uh, and this is something that I would love to uh, go deeper of a whole uh, practice called functional psychology. Uh, and this is this is a big deal because this is uh, this is not just inspiring, but actually is creating frameworks and creating processes and creating spaces for people to to really heal. And and you lead research as well uh, at the University of Washington, and you are the founder of this incredible organization focused on awareness, uh, courage, and love. So if somebody knows about polarization in the world, about uh, grieving and healing, is you. So thank you so much for joining. Louise, thank you so much for inviting me. You know, there's the academic and the scientist and the psychologist in me that has knowledge to share. And then there's just the human who is suffering along with everyone else. I think our world is more polarized than it's ever been. And we are all in the grips of, of what's happening in Israel and Palestine and, and just I don't think I'm speaking only for myself when I say I'm I'm just very devastated. And and so I'm I'm here both as a psychologist and leader and you know servant leader and just as a person wanting to connect in conversation with whoever is joining us. So you were asking me about functional analytic psychotherapy and it's it's this therapy that I co-created with my late spouse, Robert Kohlenberg, that focuses on the authentic connection between therapist and client. It basically states that whatever is most powerful is what's happening in this moment, like this moment in the therapy is between therapist and client and whatever happens in that moment, we have the most power to impact. So in this moment, you and I are in conversation with each other and with our audience. And this is our most powerful moment to be and to really listen to each other. And from the principles of functional analytic psychotherapy or FAP for short, it's where I focused on the principles of awareness, courage, and love, and founded the Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project, where we have chapter leaders in six continents who believe in the importance of living with awareness, courage, and love, and bringing it to the people in their communities. And I remember meeting you in, in 20. 17 in in Mexico and, and talking yeah. to you about it and you said yeah let's just let's do it let's co collaborate and and I love being on the advisory board of the World Happiness Foundation and watching what you do in terms of bringing happiness and justice and peace just you're such a dynamo of <laughs> energy and caring so today uh, talking about Grief, reflection, and healing in a polarized world. I, I'll just I'll start with grief, and I really would love our audience to be involved in this conversation. Okay. So, 
I can share my slides on. I just have a few slides prepared and I'm just gonna start with some, some thoughts about grief. Okay. It's a very natural emotional response to loss. And people feel it in different ways in their bodies, but it usually entails anger, hurt, disbelief, shock. And it's just, it's so important to allow that grief response to happen in our bodies. May I ask you something personal, Luis? Absolutely. Yeah, I just I just remembered when your father died. Mm. And how did you how did you experience your grief when that happened? How I experienced my grief. Well, in this case, I I went through a grateful Ness, um, kind of ritual. So I say thank you for everything that I remember uh, from him, and I and I celebrated, and I celebrated, um, because I saw him dying, and it was during COVID, and he was at the hospital. Mm. I had enough time to actually grieve real time with with my mom and my brother as well. So it was a really, it was an important moment of compassion, understanding, and, and gratefulness for, for 75 years of life. 75 years is amazing. And I could also, I could also just remember your, your sadness. Yeah, and we have a world right now where where people are feeling so much grief about what's happening. We all have our personal losses. I'm wondering if there are people in the audience who'd be willing to comment on what their grief process is like right now and all that's happening at, at possibly their own losses. So please, we are on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. So if you want to share, this is very personal, but if you want to share, please put that on comments and I will be collecting those for you. Maybe. Yeah, I really, I just really invite a conversation to the extent that we can, because that's how we uplift one another the most is by being in conversation. So in the meantime, I'm just going to talk a bit about. I, I see one see. comment. Uh, may okay. I see you want to. Uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I see one that is really, I mean, to me is really interesting because I feel the same. And uh, I see one comment about feeling discouraged. Feeling discouraged. Discouraged. It's so, it's so natural to be feeling discouraged. And you feel the same, Luis? I've yes, never, discouraged. I've never, I've never heard you say that you feel discouraged. I, oh, you know, when I, when I, when I read that discouraged, it, it, it made me feel discouraged. Be, but at the same time, the moment I feel it, I, I am contemplating the meaning of this courage. And this courage means that, to me, that I cannot believe what's going on. How is this possible? It's incomprehensible in many ways. What pushed me in this case, in my case, to try to find solutions. It's like, maybe we cannot solve right now, but we can solve the future, preventing something from happening. But I feel it, I really feel it how this person is sharing this courage because he's um, is linked to not understanding, I think. What do you I think? I think that's, yeah, I think, I think being discouraged can be linked to not understanding. And 
we can also understand deeply and feel discouraged. I think you said like you can't you can't possibly comprehend the horror that's happening. And I think that we deal with it in different ways, Luis. Like some people are are just riveted to the news all the time and some people can't can't tolerate watching the horrific images that are coming out and the things that are that are you know happening to to civilians that are unthinkable. And you're very inspirational in that you're really focused on solutions, Luis. More than most people I know, you're just so, so great at focusing on what needs to be done. And for the people who just need need to feel what they're feeling before they can move to action. I, I just, I really want to make space for that. I, I remember a long time ago, I was watching this movie on Tarzan and he, he was a little boy and he lost his eight parents and the grief that he expressed he was wailing and sobbing and and you know in some cultures that's encouraged to grieve with our full bodies and to the extent that we feel that inside us and can make room for it i just really think it's an important part of the healing process so, i see another i see another uh, thank you so much i see another one is is really powerful i see I mean, somebody saying is she's feeling as she's gonna die herself because she feels that she's losing her anchor to her identity. So and and she's living in Los Angeles, but she feels that at some point she's gonna die as well. I can I can just really I really feel the power behind those words. So this person is living in Los Angeles and feels like she's lost the anchor to her identity. Yes. So it sounds like whoever wrote that, that you're really identifying with the suffering that's that's happening in, in Israel and, and Palestine that I, I think most people are feeling that, you know, just lo losing the anchor to their identities and just a lot of terror and, and they could die at any time, which is a reality. I just, um, I want to send love to the person who wrote that. Thank you so much for voicing something so intense that so many of us are feeling. I'm going to go back to the slide about grief, and that might be anticipatory grief. You know, it's it's feeling that horrible things are going to happen, and in some cases, it's it's, it's real. Um, so, this enfranchised grief, it's it's when society might not validate or acknowledge a person's grief. And, and I think there's so much chaos happening in both Israel and Palestine and in other, other areas of the world as well. There's, no, there's really no time to acknowledge grief. So my, my daughter-in-law is Ukrainian and life goes on. It's like, there's, there's no, there's no time. She's in the U S but her family is in the Ukraine and there's no, there's no time for grief. You, you just carry on with your life and your life and, and, and then complicated, complicated grief is, is like, it's part of this enfranchised grief. It's where, especially when there's polarization going on, it can lead to this state of very prolonged grief. 
and when societal divisions hinder the normal process of healing and grief it just it just leads to this complicated process where we're feeling depressed and overwhelmed and discouraged and devastated for long long periods of time so one reason that i'm here is i, I really want us to be able to share experiences and that's part of being able to share and see and hear each other deeply as part of part of the healing mm. Then, can I ask? Can I ask you about grief? Um, do we have? I mean, every the first question is: Does everybody feel grief? Uh, for how long? And are there people that might go over it immediately, and others that might stay in that state for years? Grief is a very personal and individualized process and so yes some people might get over grief very quickly and for others it's a prolonged process and I really want to honor the individual wisdom inherent in each person so I think for you Luis you can hold your grief and and you can move on and for others it can be very very overwhelming and i just want to say that's that's okay and that trauma so there's a way that trauma really lives in our bodies and my suggestion is for you to not identify with your trauma is like you're not the trauma but feel the trauma that's in your body and we feel it in different ways and when you make room for the trauma that you experience in your body you can also make room for the parts of your body that don't feel trauma there's always something inside us that's not like a hundred percent devastated so to make room for both i would love to move to some reflection questions okay. and before before we do that i would just i'd like to to guide a, a very brief meditation on what you're feeling which is which is actually my first reflection question but what are you feeling right now just see if you can focus on your breath on your inhale and exhale and with each breath tune in more to your heart really making room tenderly for all that's in your heart. We had very powerful comments about discouragement, about I feel like I've lost my anchor, I feel like I'm going to die. Please greet those with tenderness. And I would love for you to write in comments afterwards, after you're with your heart, just to let us know what's in your heart. But I'm especially wanting to invite whispers, whispers of your heart. Just voices that don't usually get airtime. What's there that needs to be expressed? What's there that needs to be explored? Really wants some space right now. And 
to everyone who's on this call, I, I just I just want to send you love and compassion. An encouragement to to greet your feelings with tenderness. So would love you for you want to, to share. Read comment? Please. You want to... Please. This one from Annette Mason is very, very beautiful. Um, she's saying we must allow our hearts to be broken, broken open by the pain of the world. As that happens, as we let, as we let that pain in, we become the vehicles for transformation. That is so beautiful. Will you read that again, please? We must allow our hearts to be broken, broken open by the pain of the world. As that happens, as we let that pain in, we become the vehicles for transformation. Hey, Terry, that's what I mean about the wisdom of people who are with us and how important it is to be in conversation. You know, we must allow our hearts to be broken open. And that's the vehicle for transformation. Yeah. There's another comment. When you live a committed life, you become intolerant of injustice and unstoppable in addressing the things that you believe in. When you live a committed life, you become intolerant of justice and unstoppable in addressing say, in addressing the things that the you things, believe in. The things that you believe in. Lean twist. You feel that too, Luis. <laughs> you feel unstoppable. I feel unstoppable. And yeah. Well, I feel yeah. In my case. Is like I don't mind stopping because I in the way I I feel is that wisdom comes from silence, but it means unstoppable as well because when you stop, you become unstoppable because that's the moment where you are really expanding uh, to silence, you, and silence is the response to everything in many ways, and that's. From my point of view, when we are now reflecting, I feel this is what we are missing in the world. We are we are missing stopping. So it's actually the opposite. It's like, sure, I can be unstoppable, but what we need now is to stop. We have to stop violence immediately. And it's not just killing people. It's making fun of people. I always see this ladder of violence from zero to 30, 30 levels of violence. And everything starts, the first, the lower level, the lower level of violence is about making fun of people. And we do this all the time, but that's violence already. So I think that we created all this mess everywhere in so many ways because we don't stop. So I would say that for me, it is about stopping. I'm, I'm glad that you're emphasizing the point of part of being unstoppable is pausing and stopping, stopping the things that aren't working. And I know that meditation is an important practice for you and silence and the way that you emphasize silence because I, I i do i do see you as this whirlwind of motion and when you remind me of you no know, silence is really important and stopping is really important i 
And I think about our being in Bhutan and how you you love climbing tiger's nest. And, you know, there's this, you're so drawn to spirituality and silence and meditation. And that's what fuels your unstoppability. And I think what you said about there's, I think you said there are 30 levels of violence. And it, it does, it starts with very little things. And part of, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about the tribal identity and how important it is for us to feel like we, we belong to a tribe and yet that can be part of the disenfranchising of other people. I, I'm going to go back to self-reflection questions. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one around, and in this case, this is coming from, from Germany. Okay. Uh, it's about guilt. Is somehow this person is saying, see, I mean, the feeling of guilt of not being able to do enough, it's, it's really making uh, an impact. I feel that too. I feel guilt that I'm not doing enough. And that's part of part of my invitation in the meditation is to just be with the feelings that are hard. And what that person said about allowing our hearts to be broken open. It's like, I really honor your guilt. I honor my guilt. And by being with our guilt, maybe we can see what comes up from that. There are three or four comments focused on hopelessness. Hopelessness. It's like completely hopeless. It's like the feeling of we don't we don't really know what what's gonna happen. And I imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, Luis, I imagine that you want to instill hope in the people who feel hopeless. Me, myself? You, yourself. You, yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, hope is a tricky, is a tricky one, right? Because I think it's good to have hope, but it cannot be fake. I mean, somehow it has to be based on on possibilities. So, and I feel that at the same time, everything is possible. But I don't think if everything is possible in the same time for the same people. So, regardless of thinking that everything is possible, at the same time, what you what you teach and what we are learning is living in the present and looking at the present. So in this present moment, there are things that are possible and things that are not possible. So hope is not always the answer. Although for me, hope is very important because it's the activator of movement. And the moment you think that something is possible, that's a call to action in many ways. But it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an important one, hope. What do you think? I I really I really like what you said. You were talking about how it's not always possible and it's possible at different times and and for me hope and hopelessness it's just so important to hold them together and that I feel like feeling our hopeless, hopelessness is a way, is a path forward that I, I'm really, 
I think you probably already know this about me, but I am very cautious about spiritual bypassing where people just automatically opt for the higher road and it's like, no, you don't have to feel hopeless. You don't have to feel discouraged. We can, we can do something. And that's why I entitled the title of our talk, you know, hope, uh, but grief. I, I emphasize grief first because it's, we need to feel our grief. We need to feel our hopelessness, our despair as part of our reflection before we can move on to healing. And that process is, is very personal. So I just want to honor everyone here who feels hopeless. You want a last one? Another one? Sure. <laughs> These comments are amazing. Yes. <laughs> Actually, this one is coming from Valerie. Feeling theory in creating the space for grief. Mm. And feel the seed of transformation at the same time in not working, what will emerge? Can you repeat that, please? In that. So, and feel the seed of transformation at the same time in not working, no, sorry, in not knowing what will emerge. Feeling the seed of transformation in not knowing what will emerge. Uh, Valerie, it's really powerful. Thank you. You have the most amazing audience here. <laughs> this community is spectacular. Yeah, it's spectacular. I have more. I have more questions, reflection questions. Is that my PowerPoint is stuck. What self-care do you need in order to soothe your nervous system? So I would I would love to hear what people have to say about this. What self-care do you need in order to soothe your nervous system? What self-care do you need? In order to soothe your nervous system. In order to soothe your nervous system. So you can put comments, please. What self-care do you need in order to shoot your nervous system? So for me, co-regulating is really important, like being in the presence of people that I love and being able to talk at a deeper level Like right now, this is self-care for me, like talking to you. And for me being in nature, exercising, I'm, I practice this martial art and it's so important for me to be exercising in that way. What what self-care do you in, engage in? I know you do silence, what, what else? A lot of silence, contemplation. Contemplation. Contemplation, that for me is is, is the most important practice. Uh, and they, for me, there is a difference between meditation and contemplation. It's very important. Meditation is really, uh, I mean, when you practice meditation, uh, not from a reflective point of view, but actually from, from connection to uh, energy. And you let your thoughts come in and go. So you can label them and they go. But when you are contemplating, you are actually looking at your thoughts. And you see not just your thoughts, but actually what's around you. And you pay careful attention to something. And at and, and a moment in time, it moves. Or there is something else that happened. And that's the signal. No, that I, I think. something new is happening and you can integrate that in your life. So I, for me, that works very well. So I think you're you're saying that in meditation, there's more of a focus on just witnessing. 
witnessing is more on on the pleasure. Yeah. Well, and contemplation seems like a more active process where you're focusing. And so these these questions are contemplation questions, right? Yes. Yeah. I see from people uh, here, yoga nidra, it's something that Amber is using. I'm Focus sorry, I, I missed I miss what you said. Yoga nidra. Yoga uh, nidra. It, yeah, yoga nidra, yeah. yeah. So yoga nidra and focused breath work, for example. Focused breath work. It's very powerful. Yeah. Being in nature. Being in nature. Uh, Self-reflection. Mm. Somebody saying is actually moving, dancing. Moving, dancing. Being with family. Being with family. Sleeping. Actually, yeah. sleeping to me, that works so well. <laughs> I think you and I probably don't sleep enough. <laughs> that's, my, that's my guess. But, uh, no, but it, honestly, sleeping for me is like, I don't need anything. and I don't need any medicine. I just go to sleep. <laughs> that's when I really, really... Uh, recharge regenerate um so that's a big one for me as well yeah art mm. i see sylvia here so of course uh, drawing mandalas for peace mm. sharing that with others i love i love the mandalas that were drawn at the happiness fest last year they're so beautiful dancing i think dancing i just came from colombia and it was 300 women in leadership positions. And they were sharing all their stories of a struggle and coming out from the struggle much stronger. Uh, and in the end, we ended up everybody dancing, really dancing, bachata in this case. But that was a moment where you you don't you don't think, you don't focus on anything but enjoying your body and enjoying the vibration of the music. That's truly healing. And you know, bio dance. truly healing. There are so yeah. many practices, including um, uh, dancing that are, are critical. What, what do you say to people who feel guilt when they dance because other people are suffering? I think you can do both, right? You can feel guilt and you can dance. Why does it have to be one or the other? I love the answer. Yeah. Pet, so I so see I, here pet therapy. Pet well. therapy. Yes. So important. So I mean, important. All these yeah. pets. Yeah. yeah. Yesterday on the plane, I had five people around me with pets. <laughs> That's the first time. <laughs> and it was... <laughs> It was a pet festival on the plane. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if this is actually because of all what's going on. But it is the first time that I see so many service dogs. And they are they were all dogs uh, yeah. together. Sentango. This is a nice one. My mother does sentango in positive words. That's so, wonderful. That's another I, one. So I'm, I'm just... I'm noticing how uplifted I am by these descriptions of what people are doing to soothe their nervous systems. And I'm also aware of our time. So I would love for people to take a picture of these questions and, and contemplate them with people close to you. But I, I wanna focus on the last question here. How can you nurture the light in your spirit? Because now more than ever, your light is needed. I feel like we have, do you have a sense of how many people are, are with us? Luis? Well, if we combine all the social media channels, everything, I think it's about 485 people, more or less. That's a lot of people. So I would love to, to hear from some of you. How can you nurture the light in your spirit? Because now more than ever, your light is needed. How can you nurture the light in your spirit? Because now more than ever, your light 
باذن الله For some of you, it might just be synonymous with self-care, you know, what you're doing to soothe yourself. But this may go one step beyond soothing. How do you nurture the light in your spirit? There's one common here is that many tribes dance at funerals to help co-regulation. Mm. So co-regulation is a way to nurture light. And co-regulation is a yeah. way to nurture light. So what yeah. co-regulation, can you explain what that means for people who might not know? It's when we're in the presence of another and we can feel each other's breathing. So we don't have to be in person, like we can co-regulate right now. And we have been, but it can be more of an intentional practice where we breathe together. And you know, given that we're in a virtual room together, we can, we can make eye contact, we can do gestures like, We can put our hands on our hearts, feel each other's breath. Yeah. And we can listen deeply. It's like I've, I've really been listening to you and, and, just, and just feeling connection energetically. So it can be intentional or or we can just co-regulate because we're together in a shared space and we care about one another. Hmm. There's so, another comment about actually communities and governments bringing pets to people, to buildings uh, for people who are feeling lonely. That's That's a big one, right? I love that. I wasn't expecting uh, these comments about pets and it's, I don't know where I would be without my little pup. I just, he, he brings me, he really co-regulates me. So I'm aware of the time and we have wanted to wind down around now. So I'm just going to show one more slide on healing resources. Mm -hmm. And I invite people just to take a screenshot of this. But these are some, I think, really excellent books uh, for healing. The Body Keeps the Score, which is about, it's about healing trauma, braving the wilderness. It, it's about polarization, how to overcome polarization. The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. It's It offers a really good intellectual framework for understanding division. Yeah, and was... our dear colleague and friend, Adit Shiro, just yeah. a wonderful book, The Unexpected Gift of Trauma. And there are many, many books, but these are some that I'm aware of. And then online resources and websites, Better Angels, um, which is now called Braver Angels. It's, it's a, it's offers workshops on overcoming polarization, the Greater Good Science Center, just so many resources, scientific resources on, yeah, just being the better version of ourselves. Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project, that's my project, and we're actually mm -hmm. launching an international online community this weekend. And so we just, we want to bring people together to- Amazing to focus on how do we how do we lead with love and create a better world and and so there's my email just write me as to how to join this community mavis t agl global.org there's the world happiness foundation of course and i i hope that everyone will will come to the 
Happiness Fest in Miami in March. And do you want to say more about the World Happiness Foundation and, and all that you're doing, Luis? Uh, yeah, I I feel it's actually we are building all this community and the festivals for people to thrive. Uh, either because they are able to go into the shadows and connect with people to grieve if that's what they need or to get the resources and the tools as we are doing with this session in order to elevate our uh, wisdom and the way we understand life and the way we understand who we are. So that's what we do with the festival and everything that we do is really creating secure bases for people to thrive. The great and secure bases for people to thrive. I, mean, I, I know that I certainly felt like I was thriving. I mean, I, every time I attend a little <laughs> foundation <laughs> event, yeah. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. And then the Waking Up app, I, it's my favorite oh, that's med, true. meditation app. Yeah. So before we so, go, maybe I think I have there is a question here. It's a kind of a question comment, but I feel it's very linked to the whole conversation of today. And is um and this one is coming from India. And the the common question is grief is feeling is the feeling of hopelessness. So this is a affirmation and probably you can clarify that the person left in this case is to heaven, won't be back. So in that feeling of, and in that momentum, how can one feel or bring hope into life? I want to make sure I understand the question that there's, that this person experiences grief in the sense of hopelessness because they lost someone. I this think person, that they lost. So, so there's this, sense of hopelessness that they're never going to see this person again this loved exactly. one exactly and, and the question yeah. is how can we how can one feel or bring hope into life after that it's such a profound question and i cannot do it justice but I will try. First of all, I really invite you to honor your own inner wisdom in that you know, we've been talking about the power of silence and meditation, and I'm going to add prayer to that. I feel this trust. I'm just talking to this person directly. I, I, I feel a sense of trust in your inner wisdom and inner light that you know the answer to this question. How do, how do I go on with my grief and my hopelessness when I lost the person that I love so much and will never see this person again? I think that you may know the answer to that question more than anyone. And, and to just give yourself time and tenderness to be with that question. And from my humble perspective, I just want to say that there's a way that your, your loved one will live on. And I don't know what your spiritual tradition is, but I personally believe that people's spirits live on and after they pass from their physical bodies. And there are a couple of ways of really connecting with them. There's inviting, inviting them in spirit form to connect with you. And if if you believe, and there are those on the call who believe when people die, that's it, nothing. That's it. And you can believe that and also recognize that the people who have died, they live on through us. You know, love never dies. So allow whoever you've lost 
to live on through you. That's how you honor them the most. And that's how you stay connected with them. Thank you so much, maybe for that. Thank you so much for this beautiful session. And it's gonna be recorded and available to everybody uh, whenever they want to go through it. But you brought a lot of a lot of hope and a lot of wisdom in many ways. Uh, and understanding for me, understanding the process of grieving in this case and reflecting on it is the first step to healing. So and, and I feel that's the way you to build this session. So thank you for bringing this wisdom and these practical tools to many people and, and how important it is to, to listen. That's what you do. So you are actually helping all of us to heal through listening. That's powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I want to thank the audience. I, I wish I could see you and I feel Thank you for an incredible session. Thank you. See you soon for everybody joining. Uh, we are going through so much. I call this ecological anxiety. It's like going into subconscious brain and, and we are doing these sessions to bring some, some light. Uh, that light that is going to light our own light. Uh, because we all have that light in us. Thank you. See you soon. See you soon.